What's going on, New City Church? We are so glad that you are in the building or watching online. If you aren't unfamiliar with who I am, my name is Pastor Zach. I work with the youth here at the Fairburn campus. It is an honor and a privilege to be the pastor with my wonderful wife, Pastor Ashley, here. Um, yeah, you can give it up for her. She is fantastic. Um, we have a heart for young people. We have the pleasure and the ability to be able to come here and, and, and serve them. And, and because I work with youth, I do things a little different. I need some interaction. I ask questions. I just don't do it like we typically do on a Sunday. Is that okay with everybody? Um, it didn't matter if you said yes, I'm already up here. So you might as well jump right in. It's going to be a really, really good day. I want to, um, for a second, highlight something that was in that video. Um, yesterday, we had our Thanksgiving outreach, and they said hundreds, but hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people's life were impacted. Yeah, no, you should make some noise for that. Like, we were able to impact our community. Like, uh, I don't think you realize Jesus didn't just stay within the church. He went outside of the four walls and impacted other people. And yesterday, we had that same opportunity to not just Oh, what, what's, how can we help New City Church? But let's go outside of this, have people come here, and we don't look for anything in return. We just look to serve them. And we had that opportunity yesterday. It was so phenomenal from some people were here at seven something to the last, yes, Miss Tanya was doing her thing, to past 12. We, we were on the clock rolling hard, and it was a really, really great opportunity. Also, New City Church, I don't know if you were there, but this past Wednesday, District Youth, the youth ministry, put on a Thanksgiving feast at the Peachtree City campus. Yes, if you were there, then you would make noise because the food was delicious. We had a great time coming together, people cooking. The reason I'm bringing these things up is because we have life here at New City Church. Sometimes people come in and they're like, the church ain't doing nothing. If you think that, you're not looking around. The church is doing stuff, and we want you to be a part. We feel like it's valuable for you to be a part of our team, for you to understand that the church doesn't just happen if there's a bunch of people individually coming and then leaving and not having family or community with each other. We want to be a community together. And that reminds me of what's coming up Thursday. Anybody know what's happening Thursday? Yell it out. Thanksgiving, y'all are paying attention, y'all are getting it. We like to talk back and forth. This is not a monologue, this is a dialogue. We're going to have a conversation. Uh, Thanksgiving is Thursday, and it is one of my favorite holidays. I like to eat. Anybody else like to eat in the room? Anybody like to eat online? If you like to eat, drop some of your favorite food emojis in the chat because it's important for us to eat together. Jesus broke bread together with his disciples all of the time. You get to know people a little bit deeper when you're eating together. And it makes me wonder what everybody's favorite Thanksgiving food is. Drop that picture, bada boom. So um, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation. If your favorite dish is one turkey, two cornbread, three ham, four yams, five sweet potato pie, six mac and cheese, seven mashed taters, not mashed potatoes, mashed taters, um, eight dressing or nine rolls. How many people's favorite food is number one, turkey? I mean, okay, we got a few people who are raising their hands. I mean, I love me some turkey. Okay, I, I see some turkey people in the room. Mom, don't put your hand up. You're a vegetarian. She put her hand up like she eats turkey. You thought I didn't notice. Um, how many people's favorite um, Thanksgiving dish is cornbread? Anybody like cornbread? They're like, okay, a couple people are like, oh, you don't understand the way I make cornbread is different. Um, or how many people's favorite dish? Ham. Anybody ham people in the room? People are like, yeah, no, turkey good, but let me get some ham. It, it make my Thanksgiving all good. Um, how many people like yams? Anybody like yams? Oh, we see some yam people in the room. Okay, that's good to know. I would be interested to see what the dialogue is online. I will go back and look and be like, okay, you're a ham person. Whatever you are, it's okay. 
because you can bring me your favorite dish, and I'll let you know if it really should be your favorite dish. <laughs> um, that was for real. Um, number five, anybody's favorite thing was sweet potato pie? Anybody like sweet potato pie? Okay. They said, let me tell you the sweet potato, the way that you, you get the cinnamon. And the, okay, sweet potato pie, be, that's it. Um, I'm raising my hand for this next one. Mac and cheese. Oh, my God. I love me some macaroni and cheese. It is one of my favorite things to eat. Um, number seven, mashed taters. Anybody like mashed potatoes in the room? Okay, some people are like, I, I don't even eat the potato. I just like the tater part. Just the mash of the taters is delicious to me. Number eight, dressing. Yeah. Okay, we got people standing. We got people screaming. We got people like, I eat me some dressing. I feel that. I feel that. Uh, uh, anybody like the last one that we have? I know there's other dishes. I can only put so many people, uh, so many dishes in a picture. So <laughs> this is the ones that we have. Anybody like rolls? Rolls. Okay, there's a couple people like, cornbread's cool, but I prefer rolls. That makes me wonder your age, because a lot of people of a certain vintage, like me, we love us uh, some cornbread. There's just, there's something about it. So, as my family does, hot water cornbread, if you know, you know, and if you don't, it's okay. Ask somebody, you better learn. And some of y'all are like, why is this man talking about all of these different dishes? I promise it had a point. I, do you realize most of us now just go to the store, we get our meal, we get whatever we need, we get our turkey, we get whatever we need for macaroni and cheese, for mashed potatoes, we go home and we cook it. There was a point where they couldn't do that anymore. At, at, at one point, you actually crazy idea, you actually had to plant a seed yourself. You had to wait for that seed to get bigger. You, you, you had to wait a couple of seasons, and then you could harvest whatever you planted. We, we, we don't fully understand because we live in a time where if I want it, I can go to any store and get it instantly. We're so thankful for that. But I want to talk today about the value in knowing how to plant a seed. I want to talk about the value of knowing how to harvest what has been planted. Because we like the end result. But somebody had to do some work in the front end. And God has called us to do a little bit of work as Christians. If we're being honest, this is the part where a lot of people tune out. It was cool when we were talking about the picture, but now that we, I got to do work? Hey, I didn't join Christianity for that. Ah. <laughs> so, Pressa. Um, we were called to do a little bit of work as well. So today we will be talking about understanding the value of planting a seed. We will be talking about the value of knowing how to harvest. And I will even give you a few tips to make sure this works. Because I, I like I said, I work with youth, and if I just gave them a bunch of concepts, Pastor Zach, bring it down to my level. So today, we will be talking about planting a seed, we will be talking about reaping a harvest, and we'll be bringing it down to a point where everybody can understand. So let's jump right into the Word. Anybody excited for the Word? If you were excited for the picture, you should be excited for the Word. Because the picture was just fun, but the word is why we're here. Let's jump into Matthew 13, starting at verse 3. Thank you so much, Zach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds, they came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground. 
where they did not have much soil, immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Let, let, let's jump a little bit further down. You can go ahead with that next scripture. Matthew 13, same chapter, a little bit further down. Starting at verse 18, it says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Don't we like to receive things with joy? I love being joyful when someone gives me something good. But this person had no root in himself, endured for a while, but when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, they shut the deuces, they immediately fall away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. We don't want to be them. 23. As for what was sown on good soil. Someone say good soil. On good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another case sixty, and another thirty. Go ahead and put that next slide up. I will be talking about planting a seed and investing in harvest. Let's pray. God, I just thank you for allowing us to come here today. I thank you that we would have good soil in our lives, that as the word goes forth, that we would have something that would produce something fruitful. God, I thank you that we would have ears to hear, not just physical, but spiritual ears, to hear what you truly want to be said. I thank you that I wouldn't say anything extra, because you know I can be. Let me say exactly what you want me to say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, uh, I am, uh, take a passage, break the passage down, apply it to our life. So, uh, let's make it as simple as possible. Hold up your seed if you are in the building. If you are not in the building and watching online or watching later, I want to encourage you to be a part. Go get a sunflower seed. Go get a note card and connect them together in some capacity. So hold up your card. I want to see everybody's card. Make sure everybody got one. If you did not get a card yet, we have some in the back. We encourage you to go ahead and grab one right now. Oh, look at everybody. Y'all pays the attention. Got your card. That's good. Um, this seed today is going to equate to the word of God. It's going to equate to the gospel. The same way, you can put your card back down, the same way in the gospel, or the same way in this passage, the seed equates to the word. That, that seed that has to be sown. Can, can we be honest? Do you realize that over 80 times in Scripture, over 80 separate occasions in the Bible, they talk about the importance of seeds or harvest. This was a concept that they consistently talked about because Jesus specifically would have known that this would have been impactful for the people listening. They would have understood because in their day, agriculture was super vital for them. 
And what I love about this, we can apply this to our own life right now. Whatever you feel like is important to your life, God understands it. Do you realize there's nothing that you have done or will do that God does not understand? He created everything. He's been there from the beginning, he's there right now, and he will be there after we pass away. So anything that goes on in your life, you can bring it to God because you're not saying anything that he doesn't have a concept for. He either created himself or gave the person the idea to be able to create it themselves. And it's very um, encouraging, and I want to encourage you today that Jesus knows what's going on in your personal world. And he knows how to talk to you individually. The way he talks to me will not be the way that he talks to you because we have different interests. But he can talk to you individually if you give him a chance. We just have to give him a chance. And and, and the reason we have this seed, and he talks about this seed in this passage, is because Jesus knew while he was going through the parable initially, that's the first section of scripture that we read, that even if they didn't understand the biblical implications of what he was saying, they would at least understand the concept of the story. And I think it's valuable for me to give you a piece of information that many of us may not have known. Yeah, I'm one of those people. Jesus would have known, I don't know, you may not be able to see this, Actually, Isaiah, if you want to come up here and get my hands, that'd be fantastic. But Jesus would have known that the way that they um, scattered seed wasn't the way that a lot of people do in modern technology. The way that they scattered seed back in the day, would have, they would have taken the seed and dropped it. They would have walked around passing the seed out, scattering the seed all over. And then they would have come back and plowed it. It's not the same concept of us digging a hole, putting it in. They would have scattered the seed and then came back. So when he's telling them, yeah, just like a a sower goes and scatters seed, they have the concept of they're not doing it slow and steady. They're trying to get it as many places as possible, see what's the best places, come back, and then they take care of it. That's something that we don't have the concept for because we weren't there. And I want to encourage you that while you are reading the word, sometimes you may need to go back and do a little bit of digging to understand what the passage is truly trying to say. The context, we got this limited view. Sometimes we need to make it a smidge larger. So like I said, we're going to be talking about Scattering the gospel. Scattering the word of God. The reason we know that we are called to do this comes straight out of Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And it says, Jesus came and told the disciples, I have been given all authority. Someone say all. All authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Someone say all baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go to the next one. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands. Someone say all. I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The reason it's valuable for us to know And we're going to go into what it looked like for the different soils. But the reason we need to know that we are called to do this is when he says this in Scripture, this is after he has died, been resurrected. And Jesus is saying, I don't want you to just keep it amongst us. We need to go tell everybody, everyone. That person at um, at the murder station, tell them. The person at the grocery store, tell them. That person that you don't even like, the one that get on your nerves, the one who be talking behind your back at work, you need to tell them too. Everyone. If you realize that the word disciple doesn't merely mean convert 
or supporter, it meant a scholar, a learner, or a student. You may initially scatter the gospel to a lot of people, but it is important to go back and actually plow. You actually have to go back and have one-on-one conversations with people. We used to do this thing here called the Purple Book, where as soon as you got to know Jesus, you went through the Purple Book to understand more of what we do now, what we believe. And what we always used to tell people, and I think this is super valuable for us to know to this day, you only need to be one chapter ahead of somebody to lead someone else through the Purple Book. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to be perfect. God has not called you to be perfect. He has called you to make disciples and scatter the seed, share the gospel, tell the word. If we don't do that, we're missing it. We have to tell somebody. I don't want you to be perfect because as soon as you think you're perfect, you're not. (laughs) Trust me. But what I do want you to do is be willing to scatter the gospel, to share the seed, to make a disciple first by telling and then going by and plowing. So let's talk about the types of soil in this passage. To do that, I am so sorry for whoever's going to have to clean up after me. I apologize. If it's still here on Monday, I will clean it myself. (laughs) People are going to be upset. Like, he just threw stuff everywhere. It's okay. Um, So the most important thing I can tell you first is to scatter the seed. And I need you to, like like I said, hear with spiritual ears for a second. To scatter the seed, your first action isn't this. Your first action isn't throwing the seed. Your first action, consuming the seed. I can't share the gospel with somebody else if I don't know the gospel for myself. Too often, we come in and we have such a small amount of limited knowledge about the word of God, and that's what causes issues when we try to share the gospel because we might share something incorrectly because we didn't take the time to consume the seed for yourself. What do I look like going to work, physical labor job, and not have eaten first? I look silly. Like, I used to do long hair. I've done um, manual labor, like, for real, for real. I ate breakfast every time. Didn't miss breakfast. I might miss something else. I didn't miss breakfast. I might have forgot my gloves. Didn't miss breakfast. Because I knew I was going to be busy that day. The same thing is happening with us. We are called to go make disciples. We are called to go scatter the gospel. Don't miss consuming the word for yourself. I love the way Spurgeon puts it. He says, and this is going to be important, because sometimes we get nervous about like our role in scattering the gospel. He says, we noticed that the difference in each category was with the soil itself. The same seed was cast by the same sower. You cannot blame the differences in results on the sower or on the seed, but only on the soil. Oh, my dear hearers, you undergo a test today. Peradventure, you will be judging the preacher, but a greater then the preacher will be judging you. For the word itself shall judge you. Hebrews 4, 12 says, For the word of God is living and active, full of power, making operative and energizing and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and the spirit, the completeness of a person and of both joints and marrow, the deepest part of our nature. That's what that word of God goes. Exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. We don't want to be a hindrance to the word of God going out, but don't think or don't over um, equate our role 
at the end of the day, when the word goes out, the word will be the person, will be the one that judges them. That is not our job. Our job is to scatter the seed to all of the different soils. So let's talk about some of these soils. Um, that's why we have this wonderful cart of plants. I know it does not go with the overall Christmas aesthetic. I apologize, but it is what it is. I'm going to move this back for a second so as many people as possible can see this. Let's talk about scattering the seed. So the first one was on the path. We talked about scattering seed on the path. So that's me not coming over here. That's me throwing stuff all where people tread and where people walk. It'd be very similar to when we share the gospel with someone whose hearts, they didn't want to hear nothing we had to say. As soon as we even came and started talking, they were like, bro, I didn't I come here for this. Like I said, make sure we're listening with spiritual ears because sometimes as we go through these soils, we think that this is somebody else. But sometimes we didn't have our hearts prepared to hear the word. Our hearts were like, I'm okay. I came to church because it's my obligation or my duty. I'm not really listening. I, I read the Bible because my mom made me read the Bible. I'm not really trying to consume it. We, we, we don't want to allow our hearts, the soil of our lives, to be the path where something gets said, but we didn't have our spiritual ears attuned or alert enough to hear it. The second type of path. Hmm. Which one? Ooh. I like this plant. Let me let me scatter. Okay. Let me scatter some seeds uh, uh, on ground that has rocky soil. This is when we have a flash, uh, a quick bit of enthusiasm in receiving the word, and then it quickly burns out. Can I be honest? This one happens a lot with young believers. Young believers, not young people. There are some young people who are strong believers, and there are some um, more mature people who are still young believers. This is something that is very common with young believers, where the word goes out, and they're excited for a second, and then they allow that flash of enthusiasm to dissipate. And... and and if you look at it, it talks about this happens a lot of times because either tribulation or persecution. I, I felt like the tribulation can sometimes come from people's friends or their family who do not know God. Where, oh, you'll never really change. Oh, you said you love God now, but you really the same way as you've always been. You, you, made, you personally try to make steps closer to Jesus, but everybody else is like, seen this before, the tribulation can sometimes come from our friends and our family and the people closest to us. But the persecution is the one that really gets me irked because that comes from religious people. That's when condemnation comes where they want you to change without an explanation. You know what's dangerous? When we expect someone to change without giving them the knowledge of why they need to change. That's why I don't go out and just be like, Jesus, you need him. I try to explain why you need him. And we are called to do the same thing. We, we're not called to persecute new believers or young believers as they're coming in. We're called to walk beside them. We're called to love them. 
And then if you see something that may be a cause for concern, then you say something, not when you don't have a relationship with them. Relationships matter. Jesus wanted relationship with you. So why wouldn't we want relationship with each other? And this is why I said it's important and valuable for you to consume the word for yourself because sometimes we help Satan distract from the word with our actions, our incorrect theology, and the way that we treat people. We become the ones who persecute and the ones who cause tribulation because we didn't really love people the way that we were called to. It's like we consume part of the word and forgot the part, it's like we know all the rules and we forgot the part that says grace alongside of the rules. I'm not saying forget the things that need to change. That needs to change. But don't forget that Jesus loved people while they were changing. And we're called to do the same. The third one. This, this one, oh Lord, heavier than I thought. Um, <laughs> being honest. Um, this one is where you scatter the seeds, and I know it's not exactly, but among thorns. We're, we're going to call these thorns. Ow, that hurt. We're going to call these thorns. <laughs> we're going to call these thorns for the sake of argument. And this is when your ground is too fertile. You're like, Pastor that that don't even make sense. That's when anything and everything can come into your life and you take it as gospel. Someone says something. That got to be true. Someone says this, that got to be true. A politician said that, it must be real. The news said this, this must be the truth. Uh, uh, who else says people? The news, politicians, your friends, social media, school, work, you take whatever is said and it has to be gospel. So that's when the actual word comes into your life. It's competing with other things. We don't want the word of God competing with anything else. But that's not sometimes what we experience. Sometimes it competes. And you want to know why it competes? It's because we don't take everything that we hear from any source and bring it back to the Word. Everything that we hear should be brought back. Does it line up with the Word of God? If it does not, put it to the side. Everything, and that includes anything that I am saying right now. If I said something and it don't line up with the Word of God, let me know, because I don't want to keep thinking that, and I don't want you to keep thinking that anything that other people say will line up with the Word of God when a lot of times their actions and what they say just don't line up. But this last one, this is where we want to be. We want to be good ground, good soil. We want to be the ones that bear fruit. So once you've consumed the word or you've given it to other people and they've actually consumed it and they had the right, gr and they had the right ground, the right soil, what happens next is they have the ability and you have the ability to bear fruit. You can actually go harvest something. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking to have an harvest. That's me. This is my favorite tree up here. So, <laughs> and the ground look nice and fertile. This is what we're looking for. We're looking, make it easy for you. We're looking to bear good fruit. I tried to find a sunflower plant, couldn't do it. So <laughs> imagine sunflower plant. <laughs> you got me, y'all family. Um, we want to produce good fruit. The reason we want to do that is because when people come taste and see that the fruit that we have in our life is good, that makes them want to get closer to Jesus, not you. Because the fruit was not yours, it's his. So when we produce something good, people can taste and see, and what? I want Jesus. Because at the end of the day, that's why we're here, to point people back to him. So we've talked about 
planting seeds. Now, let's talk about harvesting. Uh, it's valuable to understand the importance of harvesting. We're going to jump right to Matthew 9, 35 through 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, someone say all, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest. And, and this is where I want to give you some important information about our church. We value equipping the people of God. We equip you to go out and collect the harvest. Put that scripture up there. Ephesians 4, 12 through 13, to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in knowledge of the song of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We value equipping you to go be the people of the harvest. We don't expect you to just hear the seed and figure it out on your own. We try to give you the tools and techniques, specifically the word of God, to know how to go share with other people. That is what your pastors and the staff here is ready to do. And personally, I love equipping people. But we cannot equip someone who doesn't want to be equipped. And too often, if I'm being honest, I hear people ready to do a lot of things, but they're not really ready to be equipped. Because that's the point when it becomes real and you have work to do. But I'm believing that because of Sundays and Wednesdays, people are beginning to recognize what good soil looks like and starting to attain that. I believe in you guys. I have faith that you can be a person of good soil. So let's go through four practical steps, four easy steps in my opinion, to be ready to collect a harvest, and then we'll be done. Step number one, point number one, know the word of God better for yourself. To do that, you should read the word every day, listen to the word, and meditate on the word. Ask the Holy Spirit what you just read, what does it mean? Begin to know what kind of learner you are. I know I love, I'm an auditory learner. So if I listen to the word, I understand it more than if I just read it myself. It's okay to listen to the word and then ask the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? This helps some, this helps something for good fruit to be produced in your life. And this gives you the initial ability to plant the seed. Step number two. You can go to that next slide. Thank you, Zach. Find accountability. This is a word that we bring up all the time with our students, that when I get around adults, I don't ever hear it anymore. It's crazy. Like, I don't know when uh, people got to the point where they didn't need other people to help them. I know that I'm at a point where if you know something I don't know, I'd be asking people. Like, I know, um, I was talking to Pastor Sean, and... One day, I want to have my own house, and I want to build my own house. Not from the ground up, that's crazy. <laughs> but I want to be able to do, like, a lot of renovations myself. And I'm blessed to know a lot of people in this room and a lot of people at the Peachtree City campus know how to do stuff I don't know. And I'm going to have them come alongside me 
to teach me how to do it initially, and then I can do it myself. And then I can pass that on to someone else. That's accountability, walking beside somebody so they can help you when you don't know what to do. That's what we do when we equip you as the people of God. That's what we do when we have people go through fusion. Where are my people who went through fusion in the last few weeks? My fusion people, make some noise. Oh yeah. If you did not know, fusion or for the people who are interested in joining the church, some of them have joined the church. I told them I would shout them out because they are like family to me. We want to be accountability. Grandma, I love you. Um, I didn't see you at first, sorry. Um, I want to be able to love and care for people, but that only happens if I have people beside me. I don't want to love you from a distance. I'm a hugger. Let me love you close. Maybe, maybe you're like, I've already went through Fusion, or I'm a member of this church, or I'm part of this family. You can join a crew. That's an, that's an easy way for someone else to encourage you when you don't want to sow no more seeds. You're like, I'm tired. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to do this. Someone can practically be beside you to help you. Or maybe that's just you coming on Sundays for a season and hearing the word. That's a way for you to get some accountability. Or maybe that's you coming on Wednesdays for Life Night or coming to DY, District Youth. These are, these are practical ways for you to find accountability to help you when you don't know what to do. When you have someone that you want to share the gospel with but don't have the words to say. Point number three. We got point three and point four and then we're done. Look at the groups God gave you. The people that we should be harvesting initially come from the groups God already gave us. That could be people at your job. Actually, I want to I do a little theory of mine. If I say a group that you belong to, I want you to raise your hand. Someone who has a job. Someone who has ever been to the gym. Someone who has any family members. Someone who has any friends. Anybody who's part of DY. Any party who, who lives in an apartment complex, anybody who lives in a neighborhood, anybody who goes to the grocery store, anybody who gets gas, if that's you, you have groups that you can be harvesting from. That's everyone. Everybody has somebody that they can be harvesting. You've already should be planting the seed, and if you haven't, we can start today. And then once that goes, you should find somebody that you can begin to harvest. Bring them closer to Jesus. And then number four, the last point, as we get ready to finish up, invest in people. Initially, I had this called make relationships outside the church, which is cool, but I believe that's investing in somebody. Investing takes time and effort. Investing takes money. You can pray for people. You can talk to people. You can remember what they said when you talked to somebody. It, it sounds silly, but how often do we talk to someone and then we talk to them a couple of days later and they ask the same question like, did you not remember what we talked about? Was the conversation not important? Well, when we make other people important, that's us investing in them. And maybe you're like, Pastor Zach, you don't know. My memory is not what it used to be. You can write it in your phone. What's our excuse? We have technology. I write people's names in my phone all the time. What I used to do, don't judge me, I used to take a selfie with people and then go back and write their name so then I could remember who they were. But that's because I cared enough to want to be able to invest in them. And me saying, hey, baby, versus saying your name doesn't hit the same. I want you to invest in people, specifically ones who will give you nothing back. And the reason why is because that's what we see Jesus do in Scripture. Every person he invested in could do nothing for him, but he invested anyway. Anyway. So you want to be more like Jesus. You want to plant some seeds. You want to harvest people? Be like Jesus. Invest in somebody knowing that they won't give you anything back. 
knowing that the relationship isn't symbiotic. It's parasitic. Where you're giving and they're only taking. But what you're giving them is Jesus. So what is the issue? What is the issue? So as we get ready to finish, we have bags of sunflowers. We started with this. We're going to finish with this. I want everybody to write one person's name. Someone say one. Because if I ask you to do three, we're not going to do it. I work with students. I know them. One person. One person that you can be harvesting. One person that you can invest the word of God into. One person that you can take the time to pray for them, to talk to them, to see what's really going on in their life and actually remember. One person that you would be willing to, you know what, I'll take you out for a meal. And this is the part that's going to be difficult. That person don't need to already know Jesus. That person should not know him. And if you're like, Pastor Zach, I don't know any of those people, the next time you go into the grocery store, the first person that you see work there, that's your person. If you need help finding someone, I just gave you a person. Because everybody's going to be like, well, all my friends are saved. I got out of it. Surprise. Just because your friends are saved doesn't mean there's someone who isn't going to hell who doesn't know him. I don't make all these silly jokes. If there's one thing I'm serious about, is the fact that I hate that people are going to hell. And we don't do nothing. Do we not care? Do we not? Because if if we really believe that hell is a place, we would do whatever we have to do to get people from there. If we really believed it. So either we really don't believe it, or we become so jaded that these people don't matter. Either way is not good enough for me. I'm sorry. So I want you to take some time, write one person's name down who may not know Jesus that you can invest in. I'll give you a second. Now, we're doing this now because, I, I, like I said, work with students. If I ask you to do it later, they, <clears throat> they're not going to remember. It's just what it is. I love you, Alyssa, but you, you, you be like, <laughs> you my girl. <laughs> um, I know you're not laughing. <laughs> um, but for real, write one person thing down. And then I have one last thing to say. Maybe you heard this whole thing and you're like, I've never got that relationship with Jesus in the first place. Uh, I, I may have heard the word and may have been scattered on, on ground, but at certain points, I didn't really want to hear it. Or I heard it and then I immediately let it go out of my life. Or other things have been so distracting that it doesn't stick as the most important thing in my life. Well, I want to give that person today a chance to get right with Jesus. That's why we're here. Jesus is and will always be the most important thing. So, if you haven't got yourself like right with Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity. I know in the past we've done every head bowed, every eye closed. We've done a lot of different things. I'm going to give you your first opportunity to invest in somebody else. I want you to look to your left and to your right. Ask your neighbor, do you need to get yourself right with Jesus? And if they say yes or you say yes, I want you both to come to the front. I, I, I know you may like, Pastor Zach, that's even more awkward than the other thing. But I'm just crazy enough to believe, I'm crazy enough to believe that if you need to get yourself right with Jesus, you come to the front even if other, thank you, thank you. I'm crazy enough to believe that it doesn't matter what anybody else says or thinks. If I had the prayer team come up, I'm crazy enough, thank you. I'm crazy enough to believe that it doesn't matter what anybody else says, thinks, or is looking at. If you need to get yourself right with Jesus, this is the time. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the salvation prayer. And then we have some mighty men and women in this. Come on up. We have some mighty men and women in this room who would love to pray with you, to stand with you. Because you are not alone. Come on up. You are not alone. Ain't, ain't nobody judging you. And if they are, bump them. <laughs> we don't care. Because we want to be right with Jesus. That's more important than anything else. So I'm going to read the salvation prayer. And it says, Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I know that I am a sinner. And I repent for my sins. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Today I have been made new. From this day forward, I will follow you. Amen. So before you leave, I want you to talk to one of these um, people who have more wisdom than you. Because they're going to be able to be strong accountability. And talking to my accountability people up here, this is not one of the... Ooh. This is not one of those times where we take lightly. We don't take this lightly. I want you to find someone and actually be accountability for someone. Walk beside them. They need it. And you have it to give. So we're going to take a minute. I'm going to let you guys talk, and then Tiara is going to come up and close out. But we're not going to rush. I want you to talk to somebody. The prayer is great. Accountability beside the prayer is even better. So go ahead and take a minute and talk to somebody. If you're still here and you're like, I don't need to go up there, extend your hands and pray for these people. Extend your hands and pray for these people. It'll only be a few minutes. This is your first time to invest in somebody else. Let's not miss the moment. Let's not miss the mark. Thank you, Jesus.